Hi, I'm Lucas. I'm the TOEFL expert at Magoosh.com and in this video you're going to get some listening practice that's just like listening on the real TOEFL. But first, let me introduce you to the listening section so you know what to expect. You're going to see, or hear, three recordings. This is a full set on the TOEFL listening, but on a real TOEFL you'll have two sets with six recordings all together. Here in this video we'll do just three. And in that set of three you're going to hear a conversation between two students, a lecture from a professor, and a classroom discussion with a professor and students talking together in class. Each of those recordings you should hear only one time. Do not stop the video when you're listening. Do not rewind and listen again. Just listen once and take notes. Because after every recording you're going to see questions. Five or six multiple choice questions. Meaning A, B, C, or D. Write your answer as the question is on the screen. Similar to the real test, you'll have about 30 seconds per question, so we will keep that question on the screen in the video for about 30 seconds. And in that time you should write down your answer, A, B, C, or D, after looking at your notes from what you heard before, and then you'll see the next question. At the end of all three recordings with all of their questions, You'll, you'll see the answers so you can grade your answers and find out which ones you got right and which ones you got wrong so you can learn from your mistakes and know how to improve before test day. Okay, so let's get started. You're going to hear the first recording next and then the first set of questions and after that the second recording with the second set of questions, etc. Now listen to a conversation between a student and a professor. So, Aaron, in your email you said you wanted to talk about the exam. Yeah, um, I've just never taken a class with so many different readings. I've managed to keep up with all the assignments, but I'm not sure how to... how to... How to review everything? Yeah. In other classes I've had, there's usually just one book to review, not three different books, plus all those other text excerpts and videos. Well, developmental psychology is a little more um, involved compared to some other subjects. You've looked at the study guide, I assume. Kind of. Yes. I mean, I haven't gone through the whole thing yet. I'm still just doing the stuff on the first page. You haven't looked at the second page of the study guide at all yet? No, I've barely had time to go back over the first two readings from the first page. Well, no wonder you're so confused about where to start. Let me show you a copy of the study guide. Look here. See what it says at the top of the page? This first page is just a list of all the texts and videos that'll be on the test. The actual guide is on the second page. See? Oh, wow. And it says what I need to remember from each reading. Uh-huh. So, for example, from the Intro to Adolescent Psychology book, you only need to review the developmental stages from Chapter 2. And it looks like I need to know everything from the main textbook, the big one. Right. You'll want to review all the core concepts in the first four chapters of Development Through Lifespan. Well, almost all. I forgot to mention this on the study guide, but the test won't really go into Freud's stages of development. Those are a little, uh, outdated compared to newer research. But we're still going over all of Piaget's developmental stages for children, right? Exactly. And notice that you only need to review about half of the supplemental readings, just the ones that focus on adult psychological development, and the video on Alzheimer's disease, the brain disorder in elderly people. See, I marked it right here. Okay. I feel like I understand a lot better now. I, uh, I guess I should have looked at the second page, huh? Yeah, and I actually did mention that in class. You know, you really should have checked with your classmates before coming to me. Well, I've always studied alone before. 
I don't think students should be studying solo in any class. It's always better to study with a partner or a group. It can really help avoid confusion. Yeah, I've really had trouble keeping up in class so far. I think I'll join the class study group in the library tonight. Yeah, please do. Your classmates can probably help you more than I could. You know, when it comes to organizing your notes, getting together a good study strategy, uh, that sort of thing. Why does the student visit her professor? Why does the student think reviewing for the test is especially hard in her psychology class? What is the professor's attitude towards study groups? What does the professor imply the student should do if she has any more questions about the exam? Listen again to part of the conversation, then answer the question. And notice that you only need to review about half of the supplemental readings, just the ones that focus on adult psychological development, and the video on Alzheimer's disease, the brain disorder in elderly people. See, I marked it right here. Why does the professor say this? And the video on Alzheimer's disease, the brain disorder in elderly people. See, I marked it right here. Listen to part of a lecture in a geology class. You'll recall that soil erosion is a process where soil is worn away over time. We've looked at the ways the wind can move soil, pull it apart, blow it away. Now I'm going to tell you about some of the ways that rainwater can erode soil. Remember, soil is very loose, gets very soft when it's wet. So water can have a real impact. There are a few different types of soil erosion caused by rain. Water behaves a little differently for each type of erosion, and the effects are different. For some context, let's consider bank erosion first. This kind of wearing away of the soil happens along the banks of rivers and streams, hence the name. The soil nearest to the water loosens up and starts to wash away. Plants growing in the soil come loose, too. Grass, bushes, even trees can eventually fall into running water. If you look at the edge of a river, you can notice this. The way that the land along the river seems to hang out over the water with the current under the edge of the land. This is because the soil beneath the bank has been eaten away. The effects of this are pretty clear. I'm sure you can all picture it well enough. The first significant stage of rain erosion is a bit harder to spot. We call it sheet erosion. 
This process happens more slowly. It'll happen on land that's sloped, slanted in one direction or another. As gravity pulls rain down a slope, the rain grabs some soil, takes it along for the ride. Hills will seem more sandy than level ground because they've lost some of their soil to sheet erosion. But this effect happens even on land that's just a little tilted. It just happens more slowly. It can take years to really make a difference, but eventually it really does. Very gradually, rain will strip away the soil and pull it to the bottom of the slope, and the higher land will become sandy. Plants will start to struggle and die off. Sheet erosion really only happens on slopes that are smooth so that the rainwater flows in one big sheet, flows evenly across the whole slope. This doesn't really leave room for that bank erosion I mentioned earlier. It's just an initial stage, but uh, once the slope is a little more bumpy, with uneven soil, erosion will happen less evenly too. When it rains, water will naturally flow through the lowest, smoothest path on the slope. It'll flow around the bumps, in other words, and form tiny streams. Um, I mean, not real streams, just little paths of flowing rainwater. These flows are called rills. Soil from the higher parts of the land can get washed into the rill a little. But most of the erosion happens to the soil that's directly in the rill's path. This soil gets washed away to lower ground, and the rill erosion makes a sandy path through the surrounding dirt, a path you can see even when it's not raining. Rills can change the shape of an open surface. As the soil's pushed forward, big lumps of it can form in the rill and not move all the way down the slope. So the rill will have new, different bumps to flow around the next time it rains. A rill can change its path completely, eventually. On the other hand, uh, sometimes it doesn't change all that much. Just goes along pretty much the same path every time it rains. Rills can get really deep if that happens, widening at the same time, via the bank erosion process I mentioned earlier they can develop into a more dramatic groove that's all sand and no soil. Kind of looks like a dry riverbed. A big reel like that is called a gully. Gully erosion can really mess up a piece of land. Pull the soil away from the land in large strips so that big pieces of land are no longer plant-friendly at all. There are actually more types, but it's these that we'll need to understand the process the progression toward barren land made when soil is left vulnerable to the effects of rain. Farmland between harvests, deforested expanses, unless they're covered and protected, the soil will start moving. What aspect of water erosion does the lecture focus on? According to the lecture, what are the physical effects of bank erosion? Choose two answers. According to the professor, what is the effect of sheet erosion on plant life? What can be inferred about how rills are formed?
When does gully erosion happen? Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the question. Hills will seem more sandy than level ground because they've lost some of their soil to sheet erosion. But this effect happens even on land that's just a little tilted. It just happens more slowly. It can take years to really make a difference, but eventually it really does. What does the professor imply when she says this? It can take years to really make a difference, but eventually it really does. Listen to part of a lecture in a physics class. So we obviously know that gravity causes things to fall to the ground and stay there, controls orbits, causes the tides. At least all this seems obvious now. But for the longest time, gravity was a mystery to scientists. It took thousands of years for scientists all around the world to work out how the different effects are connected. How this invisible force does its thing, Susie. You have a question. Well, yeah. I mean, thousands of years. I thought Newton didn't discover gravity until, like, the 1700s. That's less than a thousand years ago. Oh, um, 1600s actually. But I'm glad you brought him up. Newton is important. He's Kind of the opposite of the first gravity scientist, though. Newton actually finalized much of what we know about gravity, what it actually does. A lot of scientists looked at gravity before he did. There were the ancients, like Aristotle, the ancient Greek philosopher. He believed every object had its own gravity, and this is why a feather would fall slower than a stone. Aristotle would say it had less gravity inside it, less than the rock did. Roger, it looks like you have something to say. Didn't Aristotle also think that some things fell, um, up? I mean, instead of falling down. That's a very good point, Roger. Yes.、Uh, well, it's a very confusing idea Aristotle had. He believed that the gravity in things didn't just determine how fast they fell, but what direction they fell in. So, to Aristotle, the Earth was the center of the universe, and he believed most things in the universe had a gravity that naturally pulled them to the center, to the the ground. But Aristotle also believed that certain other things had different natural places. For example, fire. Aristotle thought that flames pointed upward because the natural place for a flame was up in the air above the Earth, but below the Moon. Is that what you are getting at, Roger? Yeah, I guess. I just thought Aristotle thought flames kept going up and up and up. No, Aristotle thought the flames would stop at some point at their natural place in the sky. But I can understand how you'd be confused. Aristotle's ideas seem odd to us today. Now there was another early scientist whose ideas on gravity may seem more familiar. An ancient Indian thinker from the 500s, Brahmagupta, that was his name. He believed that the Earth was basically a giant ball that was full of gravity and pulled things down to it. So, a round Earth with its own gravitational pull, just like we believe today. Now,、uh, yes, Susie. Sorry, I, I'm confused again. I thought nobody knew the Earth was round until. 
people sailed all the way around the world in in like the 14 or 1500s. How did Brahmagupta figure out the world was round? Well, actually, Susie, the theory the world is round is a very old one. In fact, it was during Aristotle's life that some of his fellow Greek scientists realized the Earth had to be round. In many ways, this idea of a round Earth was the first step toward our modern understanding of gravity. And Brahmagupta took that a step further, realizing there was gravity within the sphere of the Earth. Now, Aristotle was right, too, in a sense. Things can fall at different speeds. But uh, that's because of differences in air resistance. The atmosphere, or counteracting gravity, when it hits things that are not so compact, not, not dense. Aristotle, Brahmagupta, other ancient thinkers, were missing an important theory. Well, a fact. I'm talking about heliocentrism, the idea the Earth isn't the center of the universe, that it revolves around the sun. That idea became popular much later in the 1500s. Does anyone know who Copernicus is? Roger? He said the Earth revolved around the sun, but didn't he get in trouble for that? Didn't the church make him stop saying it? Well, he wasn't punished, but he did get a lot of grief from religious leaders at the time. The idea certainly wasn't traditional. But other scientists and the public, they embraced his ideas about planetary orbits. This new scientific attention to orbits set the stage for Newton to realize that gravity made things fall to the Earth. But they also made the moon circle the Earth. And then Newton figured out what we all know now. Larger objects have gravitational power over smaller ones. What aspect of gravitational science is the lecture mainly about? According to the professor, what two important things did the Indian science Brahmagupta realize about the Earth? How did Copernicus's study of planetary orbits help scientists understand gravity? Listen again to part of the lecture. Then, answer the question. Yeah, I guess. I just thought Aristotle thought flames kept going up and up and up. No, Aristotle thought the flames would stop at some point, at their natural place in the sky. But I can understand how you'd be confused. Aristotle's ideas seem odd to us today. Why does the professor say this? Aristotle's ideas seem odd to us today. Listen again to part of the lecture. Then, answer the question. In fact, it was during Aristotle's life that some of his fellow Greek scientists realized the Earth had to be round. In many ways, this idea of a round Earth was the first step toward our modern understanding of gravity.
What does the professor imply when he says this? In fact, it was during Aristotle's life that some of his fellow Greek scientists realized the Earth had to be round. Match each gravitational theory below to the scientist who held the theory. For answers, explanations, and help scoring, go to tofl.magoosh.com slash YouTube listening answers. You're done! Good job! How'd you do? If you want to learn more strategies and learn how to answer these questions, how to do the best on test day, come to magoosh.com. We have many more practice questions just like this and we have explanation videos for every single question that will tell you how to answer them and how to avoid those wrong answers that tricked you. Come to magooch.com and we can help you out. I hope you enjoyed this. Happy studying!